Hey, this is Jay Malone, and you are listening to Tobin Tonight. First thing I'm going to start off with saying is, you know, it's great to have you on the program, uh, another East Coaster, so uh, I guess I'll be a little bit biased and say, you know, what are you at? <laughs> what am I at? Well, right now I'm uh, I'm at raising my kids. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty much what's going on right now. So, you know, you began doing stand-up comedy in 1999 uh, while studying at University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. I, I'm going to ask you first, what were you studying in New Brunswick? Um, actually, I was gonna I was gonna be a teacher. That was the plan. So I was basically just going after my uh, my general BA. Sort of did the cycle of maritime universities. I think I'd gone to uh, I gone to Dalhousie, and I went to UNB, and that's where I started. Actually, in, in between there, I went to uh, Saint FX. So I got around when it came to universities, and but that was really it. I was just studying, ba- focusing on like English and philosophy, and had no real idea. I told people I was going to be a teacher, but I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. During all this, it says it says here you entered a comedy competition at a local pool hall called the Right Spot on a Deer. Yeah, and you made it all the way to the semifinals. So, like, what made you? I know it's a deer, but I mean, you can always say no to a deer, Jay. So, what made you kind of get up and do stand up? Well, it was you know I was uh, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I was pretty miserable at that point in my life, to be honest. Like, I was I just broken up with you know my high school sweetheart just didn't really like i said didn't really know what i wanted to do at the time right around the time the dare happened i was was actually staying with my best friend at unb so i hadn't even gone back to school yet Uh, that was the plan for the fall i was working in like this cigar store from like midnight until eight in the morning in a part of town that just kind of a seedy part of Fredericton store had been robbed a bunch of times it was just like I said, it, was, it wasn't the best time in my life, and so, I don't know, I needed something new, something different, but I didn't know what it was. And so anyway, one night I had this dream of, uh, of that I was on stage. I was doing stand-up comedy, and I did this joke. And the next day, I was playing tennis with my friend, and I just told him the idea, or the dream, the, the, you know, what, I, what I'd said on stage, and he thought it was pretty funny. And then later that day, we were listening to uh, the radio, of all things. <laughs> this is dating me, but we were uh, playing, uh, I think, play, not wasn't even PlayStation at that time. I think it was just Nintendo. And we were listening to this radio, and this comedy competition was announced. And he just turned to me, and he's like, dude, it's got to be a sign. I dare you. So I just didn't even think. I just called the number as they were saying it on the on the ad. And, and they said they had a spot left for that Friday. So this would have been a Wednesday. And I, I just took it. I just said, yes, I'll take it. And so I needed to write eight minutes of material in two days. And, you know, I'd never had any previous interest in stand-up comedy, so I didn't know how anything was done. So I was like, okay. So I wrote eight minutes and got up on stage. And it's funny, the, the only thing that worked was that bit that I had that dream about. So, yeah, so I got, like, that laugh, and that laugh was just addictive. And then, I don't know, man, if I hadn't have made the semifinals, I don't know if I ever would have got back up on stage, but... I made the semifinals for the next week, and so I actually wrote eight new minutes of material, and all the comics made fun of me because they were like, dude, you could have just done the same eight minutes, but I didn't even know that much. And then after that, it was just just an addiction. I couldn't stop. From there, then, you made the move to Toronto to pursue comedy full-time. Did it ever scare you to make that move, or was it something that you kind of felt like you needed to do? I, I felt like I needed to, for sure. Yeah, it's scary. It's all the major moves I've made in my life are, are kind of scary, but I don't really give myself time to be scared. I just sort of jump in with both feet and hope for the best. But I knew, you know, even though people kind of tried to dissuade me a little bit from it and said I should stay in school, you know, I was the one that had been on stage. So I knew, A, what it felt like and B, that I could do it. It would just be a matter of time. So, but yeah, it was, I mean, I didn't know anyone in Toronto at all when I went. I didn't have really a dollar to my name. I might have had two weeks before I had to actually get a job but yeah it's like it's it's like anything if you 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 don't really know what you're getting into you just have this goal in mind and so it's it's yeah i kind of go back and forth between is it better to prepare as much as you can or just do it and you know see what happens and my strategy whether consciously or not has always just been to do it and see what happens the risk was worth the reward because within two years you were headlining across the country appearing on television in both national and international commercials and you know comedic series 
Uh, you made three straight appearances at the Halifax Comedy Festival, something that I really enjoy. And you were uh, featured cool. on the Toronto show. I've never heard of the Toronto show. That's probably because I'm from Newfoundland. But can you explain just, you know, how that all came to be? Yeah, so when I when I got to uh, Toronto, you know, it's pretty competitive. I mean, there's lots of comics and stuff there, and so there's really sort of, at that time, two routes you could go, and it was either the independent clubs, of which I think at that time there might have been three. There was, like, the Laugh Resort, and then a couple comedy woods, one downtown, one uptown, or Yuck Yucks, and so I started off, like everybody else, knowing the name Yuck Yucks, so kind of going in that direction but it just wasn't really for me I kind of enjoyed there was more of a camaraderie between the comics and the independent club but at the same time I was also I was pursuing some artwork I'd done some cartoons and gotten published with like political cartoons and things like that so I was kind of like dipping my feet in, in both waters I guess with stand up and that and then I just remember sitting one night I don't know, it might have been like a Thursday night or something and I was sitting in my apartment drawing and you know I just I just gotten my hand slapped in every avenue I tried to go with the cartooning and I was sitting there drawing and I just thought like I'm never going to get any further in the stand up world if I don't just start going to clubs and hanging out and so that that became the strategy then rather than just go to a show that I was booked at I just started going and hanging out at the laugh resort figuring that if any comics didn't show up I'd be like hey put me up and then that and then that started to work like they you know they, they a comic wouldn't show up or whatever and they'd be like well Jay's kicking around so jump up <laughs> on stage so so then that started happening and then while I began getting more stand up comedy opportunities everyone and their dog was saying man you do, you'd probably do pretty well in commercials like uh, you know you probably could see you've got a real beer commercial type vibe so I just went and got an agent, which isn't as easy as it sounds, but thankfully when you're doing stand-up comedy, you can always kind of get them to come and see you do stand-up. And so that's what I did. I got my first agent, and I just started throwing myself into auditions, again, without really any knowledge of what the hell I was doing. But then I, I started booking, and then... And then once you get in something and you start booking it, then things just start happening. And I guess that was the same thing with stand-up and the acting. It, you know, I guess maybe I had an, a bit of a natural affinity for it, and then... Uh, and then just tried to work as hard as I could. It all works out for a reason. I, I'm actually, you know, quite entertained that that response that you're just kicking around the clubs. I mean, that because that's usually what happens, right? Like if someone doesn't show up or if a band doesn't show up, that's usually how you get your foot in the door. But yeah, the following year, 2004, was big for you because you were invited to the Just for Laughs Festival to perform in their national homegrown competition, and you took first place in that one. And mm -hmm. in that same year, you also had your one-hour stand-up on Comedy Now, and that was also received nationwide critical acclaim. So, like, what does that do for you to go on the Just for... Like, you know, being invited for Just for Laughs and having your own Comedy Now special, did you finally felt like, you know, you made it, you could do this? Yeah, the the homegrown was. It's funny, like like I I sort of consciously map that plan out. I guess like you know once once you land in any new place and you've got a goal, you kind of yeah, figure out what steps what steps are going to be necessary to get there. And so with me, you know, I've always been an NHL rather than an AHL guy, and I don't mean to uh, <laughs> to uh, crap all over my home country, but in the states, that's where in terms of entertainment, that's where the sitcoms are getting handed out. That's where you know, people at the top of the game that I was playing uh, are the most successful. And so that's sort of where I wanted to get to. Uh, having said that, I still wanted to kind of achieve the things in Canada that I could achieve. And, you know, I didn't want to go down there before I felt I was ready. So I think actually when it came to the hour-long special, the comedy now, I always felt like uh, I wanted to be overripe. So I, I felt like I probably could have done that hour-long special the year before, but the fact that I did it the year I did, I felt very ready for it and then it came out pretty well but yeah with the homegrown like I I genuinely I mean I I said to a number of people my goal is going to be to get to just for laughs because if I can get to just for laughs that's where all the um the U.S. managements and agents and all these people industry people will be and I'll be able to get my act in front of them and then you never know what's going to happen right like you hear all kinds of crazy stories of people getting like development deals and like 
you know, here's $500,000, come down to LA, sit around and pitch us a show in six months. So it was just like, that was a clear path that I saw that I was like, I can sort of skip a few steps here in Canada if I can get the attention of sort of uh, the big wigs in Hollywood. So I took that homegrown, I took a swing at it, I think the year before and I didn't get in. And then that year I got in and uh, I don't think I've ever prepared more for five minutes on stage than I did for that one. Drew a good number in the lineup. I think I was sick in the lineup and when I went out I just after the set I just knew I, I knew uh, I really knew that I'd, I'd done enough you know because I'm pretty critical anyway when I watch shows and especially of myself but also other shows like how many laughs you're getting in a minute and that, and that kind of thing and I just thought wow I think I might have won this and then I did and then it was yeah that was you know you, you talk about like moments in your life when things kind of change and that for me was was certainly one of them because the festival after that was you know I had casting at various uh, networks coming up to me one of them compared me to like Matthew Perry the, here's the new Chandler Bing I think I was introduced to at <laughs> one point like so I was yeah that that's when things started to change for sure and I don't know if you know this, but we did. I just did a little research, and it says that you were one of only two comedians to have won the Hone Crone competition and be invited to do the Just for La- or to shoot the gala for the Just for Laughs CBC Television. Yeah, I I, uh, I I think the other one's Mark Little, who's another East Coaster, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was pretty. That was, that was. I was surprised by that for sure. But to get to go back to just for laughs the next year was was pretty awesome. My favorite part because I've I've looked it up on YouTube and I've seen a few of the stand up ones that you've done. I had to kind of do a little bit of a deeper search to find the just for laugh one that I remember where you were talking about. I think it was you were you were after just getting married. Crowd applauded and you were like, "No, we don't have to applaud for this. She's not here." And I thought like, "Okay, this guy's very relaxed. He he gets it." <laughs> and then you were talking about um, like hammerhead sharks all these different types of sharks and like in my mind i was thinking okay that's that's interesting it's funny it's his own thing but i remember watching a how i met your mother episode and you watch the difference between when marshall goes up and makes a whole bunch of jokes about the different names of fish and i'm like there's your difference i know that's like they plan that bomb but when you were doing the, the shark thing compared to Marshall's thing, I was like, I was like, see, that shows that when it's a little bit more confident, when you know what you're talking about, you can you can uh, make people laugh. Yeah, it's hard to describe. I guess like it, there's there's some really good a lot of it's rhythm, right? Like a lot of it is it, it's it's kind of musical comedy. Now I'm just trying to figure out. Um, you also did. Uh, you did a little bit of writing for Comedy Inc. Was that when before you moved to L.A. or during your move to L.A.? Well, I did two seasons on that, so I was just trying to break down into Los Angeles. So, yeah, it was it was right around the same time. It wasn't it wasn't like a clean break from Canada or anything. Like I went down for pilot season. I think it's like uh, February and March. So I think I did a couple pilot seasons before I actually, like I dipped my toe in the water before I actually got my papers and went down full time in 2005, the end of 2005. I was just wondering, because I know Comedy Comedy Inc. was one of the other shows that I, I kind of watched a little bit. And when I found out you were a writer on that or you written a few episodes, I was like, okay, that's quite impressive. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was different. It was different for me because I, I, sketch wasn't ever really my thing, but they they liked my comedy, so they thought they'd they'd bring me on and give me a shot. You also had a couple of guest starring roles in like Boston Legal, uh, NCIS Los Angeles, and like you know those are pretty detective you know crime shows. So where'd you get those gigs? <laughs> well, once I got down to LA, you just kind of. Um, you just audition for whatever, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I started auditioning for different, not just comedy, but just, like, my manager wasn't a, a comedic manager, which was both frustrating in the sense that they weren't really helping me, you know, get on stage or, or you know, pursue my comedy, which I thought I was strong at. But they were giving me opportunities in this whole other realm, yeah, I guess you'd say dramatic type stuff. And, uh and so I just it was always a challenge for me so like I remember I did a monk episode where like I get shot and like I go I go down and it's in this parking garage and uh, before we start shooting my scene, they basically explain to me what they want to see happen, and so the director's just like, "Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna get shot here, and then you're gonna like stumble back a few steps. We need you to land here, <laughs> fall to the ground, and then we're gonna have a camera like six inches from your face, and I need to see you die in your eyes." And I was just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah." I, I go back while they're getting set up. I go back to my trailer, just have a panic attack because I'm like. <laughs> 
never taken an acting class in my life. I'm like, how do you die in the eyes? What the hell? Like, how did how did I get this stupid role? I'm gonna bomb completely. But anyway, you know, you just uh, again, like anything, you just do it and hope for the best. And nobody screamed at me, nobody <laughs> fired me, so I guess I got it right. In 2011, you were cast as the lead in this untitled Conoco project for TBS. What <laughs> happened with that? We did a pilot, and it didn't get picked up for TBS. Oh, that was the one. I really felt like that was the one that's sort of going to be sort of the breakout role. I mean, I got to work with Conan O'Brien and his production company, and it was with TBS. So he just started doing the talk show with TBS. And I thought, oh, man, like, this is Conan's project at TBS. How is this not going to go? And then turns out it didn't go because they went with Vince Vaughn's project. So it's like... Well, that yeah. makes sense. I, I, Bond's a pretty big star. I, I'd be a little bit like, in my mind, I'm a big Conan O'Brien fan, so I thought that was huge. But, you know, you did bring in Conan to TBS. Like, why not go with that? He's your guy. He's good. But Please contact TBS yeah. and, and, uh, <laughs> and yell at them for me. Yeah. But, I mean, it, the other thing, like, this is where I kind of... Uh, also, um, when I was doing an internship, I, I've seen you on a t- another TV series that was on City TV, and it was called uh, A Package Deal. Mm-hmm. So, how did you end up getting that role? Because I, I watched a few episodes, and I, I really enjoyed it, But and I was kind of sad when I found out that that was also no more. So, how did you end yeah. up getting there? Same deal. I, uh, it, was a, it was a Canadian production, but they auditioned it for uh, in, in Los Angeles as well, so... I just, uh, you know, it's another audition came down the pipe and I went in for it. And I, I, I just sort of connected with the role that I went out for. I really liked it. And then went in for the audition. And I don't know, you kind of like once you do enough of these auditions, you kind of get a sense of when maybe you're close on something or you're, you know, there's some interest there. Like they start asking you personal questions about yourself. So anyway, that kind of happened. And then I got called by the uh, the creator who also did like Malcolm, Malcolm in the Middle, I believe. He did like Third Rock from the Sun, things like that. And so he, we had a conversation. And he's like, you know, it's a Canadian show, but like we're getting a lot of, it's, it's going to look very American. And so I got pretty excited because, you know, Harlan Williams was involved and, and then Andrew Orenstein, the creator, like just had done so many things in L.A. And plus, I got to then come home and shoot in Canada. So I was really excited when I booked that role. And then, yeah, we did two seasons. We did one season and then thought it went pretty well. And uh, and then it was just, you know, in Canada, I guess, with sitcoms, like it was, I think, the first multicam sitcom since like 1976 or something. So there were some, I think, behind the scenes hiccups in terms of when they were airing it and like letting people know about it. It's actually pretty funny. Like even now when I get up on stage and I, I tell a story, I had a, a couple scenes with Pam Anderson. And so it's kind of a funny Pam Anderson story. And so when I started out, I'm just like, uh, did anybody see the show package deal? And it's just like dead silence. Like always like no one in the crowd has ever seen it. And like my mom couldn't even find it on TV when it was airing because they just kept switching the times and stuff. And so I feel like we hit our stride second season, but then, yeah, it just it didn't gain any traction. So that, that was it. It's odd to think about because I, we I was at a news station interning and they, you know, you've got the monitors on of other news stations and they've had, uh, I think it was like Global or City TV that was on it. I was showing it and I was like, hey, that's Jay. I'm like this must be re- this must be recent because like the scenes and everything looked pretty recent. And then next minute I went home and I was like, I've seen this show before. I'm like, okay. I'm like now. I, I mean, like it sucked, but I was like, this is still interesting because it kind of reminded me of the uh, the show that they do on NBC, Undateable. Like it kind of reminded me of that kind okay. of show in a way. And I was like, I was like, man, if this if if someone had to tell me that this show was still on today, I would be like, yeah, totally. I agree. It, it looks like it would be on right. today. The last thing I want to kind of finish off with here is, you know, you mentioned that you got we're off the hop. We mentioned about your two kids. You started writing children's books where did you get that idea from well when I was 19 my niece born so my first niece was born and it was right before I went uh, backpacking in Australia and I was pretty excited about having a little niece and so I just I wanted to write this little children's book that I had this idea for her um, and like wrote it and then this one that I actually just finally finished I wrote that so I read it when I was like 19 and then just never got around to finishing the artwork for it and then went off and had you know the Australian adventure and then got into comedy and 
comedy took precedent over any artwork because it was, especially with cartooning, because with a cartoon it takes like, you know, whatever, five hours to do a drawing. You drop it in a void. You never hear any laughs or feedback. Whereas comedy, you know, you could think of something right before you get on stage, say it, and then get the immediate feedback. So, you know, for a good portion of my life, I mean, I'm 40 now, but 20s and 30s, that immediate reaction is something you, you kind of live for. And then it just got to a point in my life where I didn't need that anymore, I guess. I don't know if I finally proved to myself I was funny or I don't know what happened, but it just sort of changed my focus. And then uh, I met a wonderful woman and we had, uh, actually, instead of two kids, we had three kids in 23 months. So I am drowning in babies and thought, this might be the time time to start uh, doing those kids books so last year i actually finally did the artwork for the um for the one that i wrote when i was 19 i based the character on my eldest son and then i've i've plotted out the next two sort of based on my other two kids and you know have a bunch of other ideas but just like stand-up comedy man like i i seem to not only enjoy doing things differently but independently so you know with the advent of like self-publishing and things like that where in, in, along the same vein as stand-up comedy, you can literally just do all the work yourself and throw it out to the world. I found that really appealing, but at the same time, it's a bit of a learning curve. So that's sort of presently where I'm at. I've published the first book. It's available. You know, since I don't have like a publishing house behind me, I have to figure out kind of like clever ways of getting the book into people's hands. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And, you know, I think using the, the comedy and using like the the giant stage of the internet to kind of try to do that is, is where I'm where my focus is right now, for sure. In addition to still doing stand-up comedy around Nova Scotia. Yeah, because I mean, I, I've got you here on Facebook and whatnot, and I see you kind of promote it through your shows. I've seen people comment that they liked the book when the latest ones was someone posted. Going to be an easy night tonight because then they show and they showed you the book. I looked yeah. at the I looked at the cover art and that and that's it looks like a lot of Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, well there uh, there is so okay. There's the book called Looking for Happiness, which is the one that's like that I was just talking about. But then like I wanted to kind of figure out how how the self publishing thing worked, and I didn't really want to necessarily just start with this book that I did. So what I did was it was right around the election when the election start, uh, was was happening and. So um, I took this like online course that kind of shows you how to navigate the self-publishing world. And this guy had done this book in 10 days. Like, so he wrote it, drew, uh, well, he didn't draw it. He got somebody else to draw it, but essentially put it up on Amazon in 10 days. And it's still his biggest seller. And so I was like, oh, well, I'm going to do that then. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, then, because then you can like, you know, you take this one book that you didn't really spend, you know, a ton of time on and then just see how the whole process works. And so what I did was I wrote a book about Donald Trump, like a children's book called Little Donnie Trump and the Magic Paintbrush. And it's basically about this like little uh, billionaire who runs around like painting his town in like a thin layer of gold, thinking that just painting it gold makes everything okay and like makes it better. But then people start getting sick from the paint fumes and they're like, hey, Donnie, can you, uh, can you, can you knock it off with the gold paint? So and then like, he, like, throws tantrums and stuff. And so, yeah, so, so that was the book I did, never thinking he would become the leader of the free world. So now I might actually revisit that book and add some more artwork to it. Because in the end, he, he apologizes to the world. And I think maybe that's all we need is for yeah. Donald Trump to just, for all of us to hear him say the words, I'm sorry, for whatever it is, it doesn't matter, just so we know he's capable of it. And maybe things will calm down. He's not going to do it though. And if he does, no, he's going to be. Not. He's probably going to be like, "Listen, it was a big deal. I'm the biggest deal. I apologize, but I don't apologize." <laughs> and then you're just kind of like, "But you just said you apologize." Yeah, but that was then. This is now, and now is in the present. And yeah, no, I mean, I, I thought it was entertaining. And I mean, it's it's great that you're doing all these projects. What what do you see yourself doing in in the future? Do you do you consider, consider yourself still writing books, or do you consider yourself getting back into um, doing sitcoms? I would say books. I think books are um, the book book writing, like uh, you know, young adult fiction and things like that, has always been, always, always, always been what I wanted to do um, ever since I was a little kid. But I just never had the self discipline to actually sit down and finish a book. It, they're really hard to write, and that's why I think comedy kind of 
call to me was because it was, like I said, it's a much faster process. You can write something in five minutes, get up on stage, and there's a real sense of completion. But with the number of book ideas that I have mapped out in my head, I, I would, I think I would lay on my deathbed and really consider myself having failed in the ultimate thing that I wanted to do if I don't actually complete a book. So, you know, stand-up comedy, however, is, uh, is something I've always loved, and I... You know, where it's just you. You write, you get up on stage, you say it. There's nobody telling you what you can and can't do. I enjoy sitcoms, man. I had nothing but fun on Package Deal and all those projects. And so if down the road that ended up being something I, I booked again or pitched with a friend or got to do, I'd be very happy. But, but if you're talking about uh, if I had my druthers, what would I like to be? I would have to say, you know, living in the woods with my family, writing novels. That's sort of where I see my future. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Jay Malone for coming on the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thanks for listening, and good night.